Hello human geographers! Tonight we examine the third agricultural revolution and its major feature, the Green Revolution. The third agricultural revolution is currently in progress and has as its principal orientation the development of genetically modified organisms, or GMO. Let's start with a little temporal context. The third agricultural revolution technically began in the 1930s, but includes the Green Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. It began in core countries like the United States and United Kingdom and diffused primarily to semi-periphery countries like India and Mexico. The focal point of the Green Revolution was increasing the yields or production of existing arable land. And that was accomplished through three things. The development of high yield seeds, the increase of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, and increased irrigation projects and mechanization of agriculture. The development of high yield seeds initially began with hybridization. In an increasingly globalized world, farmers had a wider range of plants from which to crossbreed than did local farmers earlier in history. By crossbreeding different varieties of wheat, rice, and corn, agriculturalists were able to produce strains that yielded more food per acre and grew faster. The increase in yields was accelerated by the Green Revolution, which was the recently successful development of higher yield, fast growing varieties of rice and other cereals in certain developing countries, which led to increased production per unit area and a dramatic narrowing of the gap between population growth and food needs. The principal component of the Third Agricultural Revolution was the Green Revolution, when genetically modified organisms were developed. GMOs are crops that carry new traits that have been inserted through advanced genetic engineering methods, often through combination of DNA from a similar plant or animal species. The Green Revolution was all about producing higher yield varieties of certain grain crops like rice, wheat, and corn. So just to be clear, the Third Agricultural Revolution, which includes the Green Revolution, was all about increasing yields. That was done early through hybridization. But by the 1960s and 70s, scientists had started the Green Revolution by creating genetically modified organisms. Using biotechnology, scientists could alter specific segments of DNA or transfer genes not only between species, but also between different plants and animals. The genetic modification could produce new properties, like better response to fertilizer, or resistance to disease, drought, or pesticides. As with hybrid seeds, GMO varieties were developed for the major cereal grains like wheat and rice. Later, GMO varieties of corn, soybeans, cotton, cassava, among others, were developed. By the 1990s, GMO seeds were being widely used. The genetic modification led to increased use of fertilizers and pesticides, particularly in the developing countries where the Green Revolution had the greatest impact. We also saw massive irrigation projects, including the construction of dams, irrigation pumps, and mechanical dikes to villages and individual farms. These changes led to larger harvests but farmers had to pay significantly more for new hybrid and genetically modified seeds, synthetic fertilizers, chemical pesticides, irrigation infrastructure, and mechanized farm equipment. So let's look at a few case studies where this played out. 
The Green Revolution goes back as far as the 1930s. By the 1940s, it had diffused to Mexico, where high-yield varieties of wheat and maize were introduced. Keep in mind, it took thousands of years to selectively breed maize into the crop we know today. But during the Green Revolution, it took less than a decade to develop high-yield varieties that helped to alleviate hunger in developing countries like Mexico. In fact, Mexico had previously been importing wheat and corn. But by 1960, Mexico was self-sufficient without imports and even had a wheat surplus. By the 1960s, the focal point of the Third Agricultural Revolution shifted to India and other parts of Asia. In India, for example, new hybrid rice and wheat seeds first appeared in 1966. Due to the new hybrids, India's 1970 grain production was double its 1950 level. This was because these new hybrid strains produced higher yields. For example, one variety of hybrid rice exhibited genetic resistance against 15 different pests and had a growing cycle of just 110 days, which allowed farmers to produce three crops per year in some places. By the early 1990s, this hybrid rice, known as IR36, was the most widely grown crop on Earth. Those three cropping seasons led India to develop large-scale irrigation projects to try and maximize their output. But the Green Revolution did not impact all countries and regions equally. A focus on wheat, rice, and corn meant that it had only a limited impact throughout Africa, where agriculture is based on different crops such as sorghum, millet, cassava, and cowpeas. The expensive nature of the Green Revolution meant that foreign investment was important to increasing production. African soil naturally has lower fertility than soils in Asia and other regions, and the development of the appropriate fertilizers for African soil proved expensive. In addition, the genetically modified crops often lacked natural resistance to diseases and pests in the African environment, and they failed within a few years. As a result, attracting foreign investment to assist with the development of high-yield seed varieties and transportation infrastructure throughout Africa was difficult. But some progress has been made, as recent research has led to methods for producing high-yield varieties of both cassava and sorghum. And scientists have improved food production in some areas of Africa, such as Gambia. Natural wetlands have been converted to irrigated agricultural lands, allowing for year-round production of rice. But Africa has the highest population growth rate, and the Green Revolution had the smallest impact there. Today, nearly 30% of Africa's population has been affected by food insecurity. So let's end tonight by recapping some of the positive and negative changes associated with the Green Revolution. On the positive front, global food production increased dramatically on relatively the same acreage. Through genetic modification, we have crops that produce more food per plant, are resistant to pests, and have a shorter growing season. So farmers can now grow three crops per year. This increased food output reduced hunger, lowered death rates, and fed an expanding global population. Listen to these statistics. In 1950, 55% of people in developing countries such as India, China, and the Philippines experienced hunger. The Green Revolution grew rice production in Asia by 66% between 1965 and 1985. And recent calculations estimate that more than 80% of people living in developing countries now have adequate diets. The Green Revolution also financially benefited those who invested in it. Large landowning farmers saw an increase in production and profit. There was an expansion of cash crops that were exported to a global market. In core countries, universities and multinational corporations benefited financially from their investments in the research and development of hybrid seeds and synthetic fertilizers. At the same time, due to the increased production, there was a decline in food prices, which in turn eased the economic stress of hunger. It's believed that without the Green Revolution, 
prices of food in the year 2000 would have been 66% higher. Consider this. If prices were higher, it would have led to less food, lower caloric intake, higher levels of malnutrition, and greater levels of infant and child mortality. And while these positives have been well documented, we must examine the negative effects as well. The Green Revolution was expensive. In order for farmers to benefit from it, they had to spend huge sums of money on seeds, fertilizer, and machinery. So many subsistence farmers could not afford it, leading to a widening gap between the rich commercial farmers and the poor subsistence farmers. And because many large landowning farmers produced goods for profit, much of the food that was produced was exported, leading to limited food available for locals. And many of those subsistence farmers then became low-wage, landless agricultural laborers or migrated to large urban areas in search of industrial and service sector jobs. Very similar to what happened during the second agricultural revolution. On the environmental front, the limited number of hybrid and genetically modified crops led to a decline in the diversity of food crops, which can lead to several potential problems like limited nutritional diversity, as well as greater susceptibility for negative outcomes from climate change, disease, and pests. Decline in soil nutrients has become a concern as the same parcel of land is being used for double and triple crops each year, which leads to an increase in the use of chemical fertilizers. The increased use of chemical pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers increases the opportunity that chemical runoff can contaminate drinking water, lead to species extinction, as well as health issues for the population, particularly for farm workers who spray the chemicals. Increased mechanization has led to increased air pollution, and the construction of new irrigation projects has led to declines in available groundwater. Irrigation without proper drainage can lead to soil salinization or the concentration of dissolved salts in the soil. We need to remember that there were positives and negatives of these agricultural revolutions and that they have fundamentally changed how we as humans acquire food and live our lives. We'll continue to look at this in class. Have a good evening, everyone.